In this video, we're going to continue our study of equivalence relations by discussing equivalence partitions, that is, how equivalence relations partition the underlying set. So let's recall some basic definitions. If A and B are sets, we say a relation between A and B is just a subset of the Cartesian product A cross B. All right. Now if the relation R is a subset of A cross A, so the sets A and B are the same, then we say that the relation is a relation on the set A. Okay. Now although R is a set of ordered pairs, um, instead of writing that an ordered pair A comma B is an element of R to say that A is related to B, we usually write that as A R B and read it as A is related to B. Or in the case of equivalence relations, we'll say A is equivalent to B. All right. Now let's say R is a relation on a set A. The relation is reflexive when for every element A of the set capital A, A is related to A. So a, a relation is reflexive if everything in the underlying set is related to itself. A relation is symmetric if whenever A is related to B, then B is related to A. And a relation is transitive if whenever A is related to B and B is related to C, then A is related to C. Okay, so let's let A be a set. A relation on A is called an equivalence relation if it has all three of these properties, if it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Once we define an equivalence relation, we can define an equivalence class for every element of the underlying set. So if A is a set with an equivalence relation for any element little a of that set big A, the equivalence class of A is just the set of all elements of A that are related to little a. Okay, so it's a set of all x in capital A such that x is related or equivalent to little a. That's the equivalence class of A. And we saw previously um, equivalence relations and their equivalence classes have some very nice properties. Uh, first, if any element of the set A is a member of its own equivalence class. If A is a member of the equivalence class of B, then B is a member of the equivalence class of A. If A is an element of the equivalence class of B, then the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B. And if the intersection of the equivalence classes of A and B is not empty, then those equivalence classes are identical. And we proved that theorem and its four parts in the last video. So now we want to reformulate that theorem a little bit. Um, let's let A be a set with an equivalence relation. Then the union of all of the equivalence classes for each element of A is equal to the entire underlying set A. And if the intersection of the equivalence classes is not empty, then they are equal equivalence classes. Okay, so if A, the equivalence class of A is intersected with the equivalence class of B is not empty, then the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B. So this is what we mean when we say that the equivalence classes partition the underlying set. Okay, uh, that means that they are either disjoint or identical, the equivalence classes, and the union of the equivalence classes is the whole set. Okay, that's what we mean when we say the equivalence classes partition the underlying set. So let's prove this theorem. So let's assume that A is a set with an equivalence relation. So we want to show that the union of the equivalence classes is equal to the entire underlying set A. So first we'll show that the union of the equivalence classes is a subset of the underlying set A. So notice that if A is an element of the set A, if little a is an element of the set capital A, then the equivalence class of A, which we previously defined to be the set of all x in A, so that x is equivalent to A, is indeed a subset of the underlying set. Okay, so equivalence classes are subsets of the underlying set. And so if you take their union, okay, so if you take the union of a bunch of sets which are subsets of the set A, you get a subset of the set A. All right. So the union of the equivalence classes is indeed a subset of the set A. So now let's show that A is a subset of the union of the equivalence classes. So to do that, let's start with some element X in capital A. Well, by the previous theorem, we know that X is an element of its own equivalence class, right? X is an element of the equivalence class of X. 
And since the equivalence class of x is going to show up in the union of all the possible equivalence classes, it follows that x is an element of one of those equivalence classes, namely the equivalence class of x, and therefore it's eligible, it's a member of the union of all of the equivalence classes. Okay, so if x is an element of the, of the underlying set A, then it's a member of one of the equivalence classes, and therefore it's a member of the union of the equivalence classes. All right? And so therefore, the set A, the underlying set A, is a subset of the union of the equivalence classes. And now we've proved both the union of the equivalence classes is a subset of A, and A is a subset of the union of the equivalence classes, so it follows that the union of the equivalence classes is equal to the underlying set A. All right. The other claim in the theorem was that if the intersection of two equivalence classes is not empty, then those equivalence classes are identical. And of course, we proved that as part four of the previous theorem, All right? and that was done in a previous video. So now that we've defined um, equivalence relations, equivalence classes, and demonstrated how they partition the underlying set, we can define a new space or a new set given a, a set with an equivalence relation. So if A is a set with an equivalence relation, we define a new set called A mod equivalence, or sometimes we write that as A mod and then the symbol for the equivalence relation. And A mod equivalence is simply the set of all equivalence classes under that equivalence relation. All right. So it's a set of sets. It's a set of subsets of the underlying space. And it's a partition, so again, all of these sets are disjoint, and the union of all of these sets is going to be the entire set A. All right. So A mod equivalence is just the set of all equivalence classes under the equivalence relation. Now to see that in terms of an example we've studied before, let's say we have a relation on the integers defined as follows. n is related to m, or n is equivalent to m, if and only if n minus m is even. We proved previously that this is an equivalence relation. So we know this is an equivalence relation, and we proved that the equivalence class of 0 is all the even numbers, and the equivalence class of 1 is all the odd numbers. Okay, so in this example, there are only two equivalence classes, 0 and 1. Of course, we know from the last video that the equivalence class of 2 is equal to the equivalence class of 0 and so on. The equivalence class of 1 is the same as the equivalence class of negative 1, and same as the equivalence class of 3, and negative 3, and so on. So there really are only two equivalence classes, although they might have different names. So we would say in this case that Z mod equivalence is just the set consisting of the equivalence class of 0 and the equivalence class of 1. And again, from what I just said, that would be the same as the set containing the equivalence class of 2 and the equivalence class of 3, or the equivalence class of 18 and the equivalence class of negative 37, for example. The point being, though, that there are just two equivalence classes in Z mod equivalence. Okay, notice that as our theorem above implies, we also have that with these two equivalence classes, um, they are not equal to each other, and therefore their intersection is empty. And if we take the union of the two equivalence classes, we get all of the integers. So these two equivalence classes in Z mod equivalence class are indeed a partition of the integers. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks for listening.